Shalom! <laughs> it's hard not to like the Jews. They are so good at so many things. Stand-up comedy, controlling the world governments, <laughs> coming up with irrational and immoral nonsense and then making most of the world believe it. And then they counter it. Strange. They are opposing their own ideas. It's almost as if they were just regular people who think for themselves and it's totally unjustified to think of them as a collective. Ah, what am I talking about? Of course it's justified! But when it comes to extraordinary Jewish ideas, you might have heard about one called Kabbalah, but I bet you do not know what exactly it is. So, what is Kabbalah? Kabbalah is a science. Right, right. Okay, a science. I'm gonna give you one more chance to answer this question again, okay? I promise you, you're not gonna like what I do with this. What is Kabbalah? Kabbalah is a science. Fine! If that's what you wanted, that's what you'll get. Today we shall consider Kabbalah. Let's do it. Okay, but seriously now, what is Kabbalah? Well, it's rather hard to categorize as it encompasses a lot of different views on a lot of different issues. From what I've read, it mainly deals with the nature of God and with finding the hidden meanings in the Torah, because the assumption is that there are such hidden meanings. Basically, the claim is that the Jews who studied the Torah over the last hundreds of years discovered that the meaning of the Torah is not only historical, but also allegorical, or as some other Kabbalists say, it is only allegorical, and in fact nothing in the Torah or any other Kabbalistic text points to the physical world. And there are other Kabbalistic texts. There was the Torah, and somebody commented on it, so another guy commented on the comments, and then a fourth guy commented on the comments of the comments, by the way, by far the most important Kabbalistic text is the Zohar, uh, which is a commentary on the Torah. Right, so I said that these don't point to the physical world, so I think you know what's coming next. Yes, Kabbalah postulates that apart from the physical world, which is the least important of them all, there are also five more spiritual realms. God, of course, occupies the highest spiritual reality, and you can join him, so they claim. Although Kabbalah came out of Judaism, some Kabbalists claim that it predates all religions and that it is, in fact, an independent worldview. So you're telling me that this is a coincidence that you're all wearing yarmulkes and have long beards, right? Also, there are some parts of it which strongly resemble Eastern mysticism, in my opinion, like the concept of being endlessly unsatisfied and our endless attempts to reap more benefits out of this life and the quest for, for getting rid of the ego, getting rid of egoism. Although some Kabbalists would like to deny this, Kabbalah is basically a theistic worldview. In their view, God transcends reality. You might be familiar with pantheism, which is the concept that the universe is synonymous with God, basically. Uh, Kabbalah would have a different view on this issue, called panentheism which is the belief that God is everywhere within this reality and also in realms beyond it, beyond this reality. Our material reality in Kabbalah is called the vessel and the influence of the creator, his force, his nature is called the light. And there's nothing else in this universe, there's just the vessel and the light and that's it, no evil forces. So it postulates an intelligent and loving God, so it has to deal with all of the implications that go along with that. So answering the divine hiddenness problem and the problem of evil are staples in Kabbalah. Also, I think that some clarification is needed on what Kabbalah is not. You might be aware of some celebrities which got involved with Kabbalah. Madonna is one of them. And they usually follow a version of Kabbalah which is rejected by the vast majority of Kabbalists. Madonna studied with the Kabbalah Center, which is thought to present a bastardized picture of what Kabbalah is. And I must say, their views are rather eccentric.
Also, the red string is supposed to be a Kabbalistic uh, amulet. Of course, you can buy the red string from Kabbalah Center's store. The red string is supposed to prevent you from the evil eye. Hardly any Kabbalists acknowledge the red string because, as I stated before, they don't even accept the existence of any evil forces. So there's nothing to protect oneself against. Also, there are books like this one out there. This one says Kabbalah, the secrets of card divination. <laughs> Kabbalists such as Israel Bernath actually claim that this has absolutely nothing to do with Kabbalah because Kabbalah is committed to the idea of free will. So this cannot possibly work because the future is not determined. So that's an overview of Kabbalah. Before I delve any deeper into this, I want to stress that I was using mainly the material of Kabbalah.info and Lightman stuff, which I'm told is heavily biased uh, towards Yehuda Ashlag's point of view. I'm aware that there are other schools of thought within Kabbalah, so if you think that my criticism does not apply to your specific branch of Kabbalah and that yours is rational and justified, then please get back to me, I'll be happy to, to address your specific version. So here's how Tony Kozinek actually explains this. We have five senses with which we perceive reality. However, please notice that these senses aren't perfect. A bat hears the world in a totally different way than you do, because some of his sensory instruments are far more acute than yours. And an eagle sees the world in a totally different way, because its eyes are built totally differently. Also, please note that you can, for example, lose your sense of taste or smell because of a sickness. So your senses don't really show you reality. They show you reality as perceived by you. However, fear not, because the Kabbalists say that you can perceive the objective, ultimate reality. This spiritual reality, by the way, is synonymous with God. And here's where the Kabbalah is a science nonsense comes in. They say that unlike religions, Kabbalah does not rely on faith. It gives you specific tools, a manual for developing your sixth sense. With this sixth sense, you will be able to perceive higher reality and be one with God. Be one with God? Where did that come from? And how does one go about doing that? Well, the Kabbalists noticed that whatever you do, whatever movement you make, even the little movements that you make while watching this video are supposed to bring you some benefit, some little comfort that you wouldn't otherwise have. If you buy a donut, it is to feel satiated. If you buy an eyeliner, it is to feel prettier. If you go to work, it is to be able to sustain yourself. We constantly want and want to receive benefits, so our vessel the world here is the will to receive. But there's another force in the cosmos, and it is the will to bestow. It is unconditional altruism, and it is synonymous with God. Whatever that means. And everything in this universe is an interaction between the will to receive and the will to bestow. Between the creature and the creator and between the vessel and the light. All of these terms are used interchangeably. How do we reconnect with the Creator? By the way, this is a reunion, because we were once a part of the Creator. We are basically one being, but divided into parts, and we need to merge once again with the Creator and with ourselves. So how do we reconnect? It's basically by changing your will to receive, into the will to bestow. Then, once your nature is reconnected to the Creator, you will perceive Him. The way I imagine it is like musical instruments. If you have a musical instrument like a guitar, which has a string tuned to a specific frequency, then if you strike it, another string on a different guitar will also resonate if it's tuned to the same frequency. Basically, this is how it works. And this, the Kabbalists claim, is the ultimate satisfaction and the purpose of your life. <laughs> well, maybe not. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so I think I've spent enough time explaining the doctrine. When I was presenting these ideas just now, I hope some questions popped up in your mind. 
If they did, that means that you have some mechanism of intellectual self-defense. <laughs> and I congratulate you for that. I was listening to Michael Lightman's books and there are a few questions that my mind just wants to scream out after any other sentence in his works. And here they are. How do you know this? How did you determine this? What makes you sure that this is true? Why is this a justified belief? The response from the other side that I predict is, well, I perceive the creator, of course. It's strange, but I didn't really find any rabbi or rav who would say openly, I have perceived God and here's how it was like. Presumably, Lightman has perceived the higher reality. The first book he published on Kabbalah was in 2002. So he had 14 years to do that. Please, Lightman, please create a video which is just about that, okay? Please feel free to do that. Tony Kozinek informs us that the communication with the creator is not done via words. So that's extremely convenient for your philosophy, isn't it? This excludes the possibility that the creator could provide you with some miraculous knowledge and lend some credence to your claims. There's nothing we can say to your Kabbalists, is there? Because as it is now, the concepts you have provided are so murky, so vague, that there's nothing to hang your hat on. There's this documentary out there called Kabbalah Me, and I didn't actually get a chance to see it, but I can assure you that their YouTube channel has solid, high-quality content. Um, and actually, it's really helpful if you want to figure out what Kabbalah is. They have a range of interviews with Kabbalists, but from what I've seen, not once, not once have the rabbis been asked, why is your theological view more justified than any other? Not once has the question, what do you have to offer to demonstrate that the story you have told isn't bullshit, been posed. What I have here is a racist book of Jewish jokes. <sighs> to put it mildly, some people here in Poland must have had slightly different ideas about political correctness here in the 1980s. Just to let you know, I have not bought this book, neither did my parents or my brother, okay? <laughs> Old Silverman approaches a rabbi. Rabbi, I want a divorce. I cannot stand my wife any longer. She's ugly and keeps on nagging. And I have something better uh, in view. Then divorce. Right, Rabbi, but I have lived with her for so many years. She always cared for me. Then don't divorce. Right, but why would I squander my life when I can be happy? Then divorce. But I feel regret, you know, she's old and sick. Then baptize. What for? Then you'll be bothering the priest and not me. Dear Kabbalistic Rabbis, you are equally helpful when it comes to making me determine whether Kabbalah is an accurate description of reality. You know, I have considered pseudosciences on this channel before, astrology for example. And astrology is a much better hypothesis than Kabbalah is. You know why? Because at least it's false. And Kabbalah is not even false, because its propositions cannot be shown to be either true or false. Imagine that I would meet a person who says that they have the sixth sense right now and they perceive the higher reality. What then? What would that prove? Here's a Polish priest who claims that nothing will change his mind about Christ because Christ to him is as real as you and me. Sai and Ken will never change their minds either. They've said it many times. Both Christians, a Muslim suicide bomber, by the nature of what he is doing, is sending us the message that his certainty in the existence of Allah is sufficient to sacrifice everything in this world, okay? So where should I invest my time? Which of those beliefs should I adopt? Should I invest my time into any of those beliefs? I understand that you offer a way of reinterpreting the events portrayed in the Torah, but how did you decide that the Torah contains any valuable information about the reality we live in in the first place. Kabbalah is not a falsifiable worldview. There's nothing we could observe in this world that would make us realize that the Kabbalistic story is shite. Let me give an example. If my belief is that a Fiat 126 is faster than a Porsche Ferdinand GT3, 
All it takes to disprove this belief is for both of those cars to go as fast as possible. Then we would find out. And in this case, that's true. This is a true belief. Porsche Ferdinand GT3 is basically a bicycle. If my belief is that the woman who I think is my mother is really my biological mother, then all it takes to disprove this is a DNA test. Then we would know. A DNA test could potentially show that I'm wrong about this. In both cases, if contrary evidence arrives, I am no longer rationally justified to hold that belief. So I will simply delete it out of the imaginary list of beliefs that I hold and replace it with one which is a better representation of reality as I understand it. So far, you Kabbalists have supplied me with your belief. Do you have anything analogous to a DNA test to make us figure out whether Kabbalah is shite or not? Let's hear what you have to offer as the falsification. Okay, let's give another Kabbalist some grief. <laughs> There's this guy who is a Zohar scholar uh, called Daniel Matt. Listen to me now, Daniel Matt. I like you. First of all, you are in a totally different league than Michael Lightman, because you are a reasonable person. I wish people around me believed in the sort of God that you believe in. A God which in no way actually blocks you from honestly examining the world around you and from being amazed by the discoveries of physics. So a God that does not stand in the way of intellectual honesty. And I appreciate that. And I'm not saying that the study of the Zohar from a literary or historical perspective is not a valuable thing to do. Of course it's valuable. But what made you decide that Kabbalah is a good representation of reality? In one interview, Daniel Matt states that if you reject religion, you are really missing a part of the human adventure or of human wisdom, in that science and religion can learn from one another. Okay then. Could you please name something, anything, that science can learn from religion? What? Dogmatism? The inability and unwillingness to change your mind? I'm not saying that science has to be the only source of all of your beliefs. I'm just saying that religion isn't a justified source for any of your beliefs. Let's hear more from Daniel Matt. Here's what he has to say about the brilliant physicist Stephen Hawking. Hawking tries to explain how the universe began without a need for God. He really wants to explain the origin of the universe without invoking religious language or any theology. No. Hawking tries to explain how the universe began. This is where you should have stopped the sentence. Not only Hawking, but any of the modern physicists working on that question try to figure out what is the best explanation of the Big Bang. And until it is demonstrated that it was, in fact, a god, they are not justified to say that. It's not that he wants this not to be a god. He just realizes that if you stumble upon a problem and you don't know what's the answer, then the only conclusion you can arrive at is I don't know the answer and not God did it. This is the argument from ignorance fallacy and specifically a subgroup of it, the God of the gaps argument. Daniel. Please notice that you wouldn't dream of saying he really wants to explain what causes lightning without the need for Zeus. But if you go far back to the past, and I think you know this, you will see people who think that epilepsy, wind, failing crops, disease, tornadoes were all acts of God. And they were wrong. And now we have the explanations. We currently do not know why there is something rather than nothing. But this doesn't give you a reason to try to squeeze God into that hole in human understanding. And Daniel, if you want to tell me that God is synonymous with the energy which animates the universe, then you have to provide me with a method for distinguishing the universe in which there is such an animating force from one in which there isn't. So we come back to the notion of falsifiability once again. And if you want to redefine God to mean energy, then please note that I already have a name for energy. It's energy. We shall consider more of Daniel Matt's material in the third part of this series. Thanks. A few days ago, I was talking to a pair of Jehovah's Witnesses, and I used this term falsifiable a few times. And the girl said, you really like this word, falsifiable, don't you? 
And I said, yes. Yes, I like it very much. Because falsifiability is probably the most important tool in my toolkit for deciding which of the beliefs that I encounter in this world I should adopt. If you have found something better for that purpose, then please let me know what it is. You have no idea how grateful I'll be to you. And Kabbalists, please try to understand me. I cannot first accept this idea of yours and then do what I'm supposed to do and wait for the perception of higher reality to sort of switch itself on. You know why? Because first taking it on faith and then waiting for the revelations to kick in is exactly what all of the other religions that I have encountered want me to do. And knowing what confirmation bias is, I can say with confidence that this is a sure way to delude yourself. Is Kabbalah a science? No, it is not a science. You can ask Karl Popper about it. Karl, is Kabbalah a science? No. You heard him. Kabbalah is not a science. And some of you don't want me to call Kabbalah a religion. Then okay, I won't. In that case, it might be a superstition. It might be a belief system. It might be a lifestyle. It might be a part of Judaism. But whatever it is, if it is anything, then it is certainly not a science. Nor is it a justified belief to hold. In the next part of this series, we shall consider some claims regarding the Zohar's divine insights. And in the third part, we shall consider the divine attributes of God, according to Kabbalah, and some dangers regarding Kabbalah. Uh, my name is Luke Vibranchik, and I dare doubt.